through 23. We're on the second major section of Isaiah, which is speaking about a judgment against various nations. There are ten that are mentioned um, in Isaiah uh, from uh, chapters 13 through 23. We are finishing those tonight. We noticed uh, on Sunday, starting that uh, number four under B, um, oracles concerning Ethiopia and Egypt. In chapter 18, we see Ethiopia, and in chapter 19, we see Egypt, and in chapter 20, there is the uh, illustration of judgment and a sign not just against Ethiopia and Egypt together, but for Judah to see, and we'll kind of make some connections there. So in chapter 20, they're combined together. Uh, To lay some groundwork for that, though, what was, uh, remember in chapter 18, he doesn't say the burden against Ethiopia. He just says, whoa, and many translations just say, ah, or alas, or some other kind of uh, beckoning word calling their attention. He's speaking to them, not necessarily um, speaking uh, evil onto them, a uh, burden, if you will. But he's telling them not to do something, or really instructing his own people not to do something. He speaks about how they send ambassadors by the sea and vessels of reed on the waters. Who do we say they were sending ambassadors to and for what reason, if you remember? Okay, Assyria is coming down, conquering people. Ethiopia is south of Judah, seeing Assyria coming, sends ambassadors up to Judah. And what they're trying to do is to form an alliance with Judah so that when Assyria comes through, they hopefully can fend them off together. Already in the land of Judah, coming up to Jerusalem, remember, is Assyria. And what were they instructed to tell these messengers? In verse 2, go. Go where? They're coming to Judah, and now they're sending them back to the same description of verse 1. Or as as you see later on, concerning Ethiopia, people terrible from the beginning onward, a, a nation tall and smooth of skin. And so Ethiopia is going up to Judah, and God's telling them, go back to Ethiopia. And so, in other words, don't form an alliance. And that's where we got to what Jehovah was doing. He is sitting and taking his rest, verse 4. And it's not that he's indifferent about things, but he's allowing things to ripen. And that's the language there. It's like he's allowing things fruit to ripen so that then he can go harvest. He's allowing Assyria to do all the work that he wants Assyria to do. We talked about how Assyria is just the tool in Jehovah's hands. And so, I'm, you know, don't fret Ethiopia. Don't fret Judah. Don't, don't trust in each other. Don't join alliances. So he's not only calling on Israel and Judah to don't, don't put your trust in other people. Put your trust in me, but also to other nations. Right? Ethiopia are not a people of God in that regard. I mean, God is the God of the whole world, but they're not the called out people of God as Israel and Judah are. But he's even telling Ethiopia to trust in Jehovah, not in Judah. And, and it might seem that they're putting their trust in Jehovah by sending ambassadors to Judah, but that's not their mindset. We need the help of this physical nation. So go back to Ethiopia. God's going to handle this. He's, he's not doing anything right now. Because he's letting things ripen, then he'll judge the Assyrians. And that's exactly what happens. And in verse 7 of chapter 18, which is more than likely also a messianic consideration, as you see Mount Zion mentioned there at the end, the Ethiopians send gifts to um, God in Jerusalem for the deliverance from the Assyrians. Um, But like I said, likely the deliverance in the messianic age. So keep that in mind as we start studying chapter 19 and especially get into Chapter 20, time and time again already, God has um, looked down upon forming alliances with each other and encouraged people to put their trust in him. Remember in chapter 7, uh, Assyria was the threat, obviously. And what did Syria and Israel do? Not Assyria, but Syria and Israel. What did they do? They joined an alliance. They wanted Judah to join in that, didn't they? But Judah didn't want to. So then they turned their fierce anger toward Judah. They were going to set up a puppet king and force Judah's hand into the alliance. And that's when the prophecy came to Ahaz about 
Emmanuel, that this is a sign, you don't have to worry about this, um, God's going to take care of them, and instead what Ahaz did is he actually looked to Assyria, so Assyria is the threat, now he's feeling some pressure from Syria and Israel, and so he turns to the biggest threat of them all, thinking if I just kind of kiss up to him, he'll avoid us, and he'll, he'll spare us, and it backfired on him. So you have all these alliances going on, these conspiracies, if you will, is a word that is used in chapter 8. And what Jehovah continually does is says, trust in me, don't trust in each other. You can't help each other, um, only I can help you. And so then you've got the, that, the threat of Assyria that's coming um, as well with Egypt and Ethiopia. And they would be people that Judah would likely turn and uh, look to for, for help. In fact, um, in the next uh, couple sections after this, in chapter 30 and 31, Egypt is mentioned in regard to uh, Judah's relationship with various people. And in verse 1 of chapter 30, uh, God says to um, Judah, I feel like I'm really loud. Am I really loud tonight? I think this mic is extra sensitive. He says, Woe to the rebellious children who take counsel, but not of me, and devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk uh, to go down to Egypt. And they'll actually send gifts down to Egypt. There's, there are three parties in Judah. There, there's the Assyrian party, there's the Egyptian party, and then there is the Jehovah party. And here in chapter 30, you've got some people in Judah sending gifts to Egypt to help in the threat um, with Assyria. And chapter 31 deals with that again. So time and time again, God is saying, don't form alliances, trust in me. And that's where we find ourselves here in chapter 19. In chapter 18, Ethiopia is mentioned, and they are not to trust in Judah, but in Jehovah. But also, Judah is not supposed to trust in Ethiopia any more than they should in Egypt. And we're going to see why, because these nations are going to fall. And if they're going to fall toward, uh, against the threat, then, you know, who are they going to be to deliver all right, so in verse 1, beginning the burden against Egypt. Um, again, burden meaning oracle, but something heavy to bear. The Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. And so you've got first um, a, a section that describes how Jehovah will bring judgment upon Egypt. And it concerns civil war. We'll get to that in a moment, beginning in verse 2. They'll be torn apart from the inside out. But notice first he says, the Lord rides on a swift cloud. We talked in chapter 13, I believe it was, in the first um, burden against Babylon. Yes, chapter 13, especially in verse 10, when it used the language of the stars of the heaven and the constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and it's going forth and the moon will not cause its light to shine. We see some of the same language in the New Testament, especially in a text like Matthew 24, where there is a division in that context between the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and then it eventually transitions into the end times, that is, the final judgment, world judgment, universal spiritual judgment, not end time. And what we see in that first section are some of the same kind of language being dealt with, including this idea of the Lord rides on a swift cloud. And it's not necessarily literal. In Matthew 24, the context is the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Here it is the judgment against the nation in time of Egypt. And so we're not talking about the end of time and the end of the world and the end judgment. This language speaks of national judgment. The Lord is not literally riding on a swift cloud where literally people will see him in the air. It is figurative. He's coming into Egypt in judgment. And, and keep that in mind. All of this kind of stuff that we read in chapter 19, it's really indirect. It's not that Jehovah is going to wipe them out like he will do with the Assyrians in uh, the 37th, 36 or 37th chapter, the historical section, um, where he comes against Assyria, who's come up against Jerusalem, and he wipes out 185,000, an angel does. It, it's not even that kind of judgment. It's, it's judging through providence, if you will. That's what we've seen time and time again. 
Assyria is being used as a tool in God's hand. But does Assyria know that God is using him? No. Egypt's about to tear each other apart. And so that seems like it's their own fault. In many ways it is. But God is using all of these men and their evil schemings and all this kind of stuff to bring judgment upon a sinful nation. And so keep that in mind as we go. Um, their idols are going to be seen as impotent before the great and true God of the universe, Jehovah, and their heart will melt. So, civil war, verse 2. I will set Egyptians against Egyptians. Everyone fought, will fight against his brother. Everyone against his neighbor. Uh, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of Egypt will fail in its midst. I will destroy their council. We'll remember that because he's going to talk more about that later on. He's destroying their wise counsel. Their wise men won't be able to help them come out of this. They will consult the idols and charmers and mediums and uh, sorcerers, and nothing is going to, to work. The Egyptians I will give into the hand of a cruel master and a fierce king who will rule over them. That's likely the Assyrian capture of Egypt in 671 B.C. What did uh, Jesus say uh, in Matthew 12 when he was he cast out a demon Pharisee said, you did that by the power of Satan. What, what did he say that kind of fits this context? I know that's off the top of your head. But. A kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Isn't that an object lesson for us? Any nation, uh, any family, any church. Um, there's a reason why the scripture is replete with exhortations to unity in the spirit. Uh, unity amongst brethren. Egypt showed that this kind of turning against one another um, is destructive. And, and we even saw that um, with other nations as well already in Isaiah. And so you have a civil war. Internal conflict would bring them down. Also, industry fails. And what we're, we're going to see in this section is everything is connected. And I think that this resonates with us Right now, there's been plenty of instances like this in our nation and in other parts of the world. But when you have a policy that um, you know restricts our drilling or restricts a pipeline or restricts our uh, bringing in oil from another foreign place, so on and so forth, what prices of what go up? Everything, right? Not just gas, but everything goes up because it's all connected. And so when you see something fail in a society, there's often a ripple effect, and it leads to other problems. And, and you can see how God can use some, something that's seemingly isolated sometimes, we may look at it as, at least initially, and see how he can use that to bring about a greater uh, catastrophe. And he doesn't even have to do anything miraculously. He's just ruling from heaven using men the way he wants to use them. That's kind of what we start seeing here. First of all, when you think of Egypt and water, what's a body of water you think of? The Nile, right? How important is the Nile to Egypt? Very important. So there you have it. In verse 5, the waters will fail from the sea and the river will be wasted and dried up. You see, likely actually just referencing or referring to the Nile. So the, the river dries up, and it's not speaking about it's literally just rocks, but once a year there's um, the flooding of the delta in the Nile um, where you've got all those different branching off, and that's where the fertile crescent is, if you think, uh, in you know, past geography studies, if you will. And they relied upon that greatly. And so all these vegetation descriptions, it, it's all a domino effect from that. And then you've got the people that are planting and watering, and they're, they're depending upon um, the flooding of that region to bring about that sediment and to irrigate these plants. And, and they're going to sell that in the markets, and they're going to export that, and they're going to thrive on those things. So when one thing fails, everyone hurts. And this is certainly how the Lord is striking them. The rivers are turning foul, and the brooks of defense will be emptied and dried up. The reeds and the rushes will wither. The papyrus reeds by the river will, uh, by the mouth of the river, and everything sown by the river will wither, be driven away, and no more. And obviously, if the river's having problems, you've got fishermen who are mourning. They'll lament who cast hooks in the river. They will languish who spread nets 
on the waters, and, and it's the, the fishermen, obviously, they're going to be in sorrow because that's their livelihood. But are they the only one that rely on fish? <laughs> no. They're going to sell that to others as a primary source of sustenance, and so others are going to um, mourn as well. He speaks about, in verse 9, those who work and find flax and those who weave fine fabric, they'll be ashamed. And so um, there was combed flax uh, that was woven into linen, uh, made from papyrus reeves. That was this kind of prized possession of fine fabric. That's not going to be available because of this. The foundations will be broken. All who make wages uh, will be troubled of soul. You so think of a foundation of a society. Uh, used to be in America is agriculture, not so much anymore. But you think of the niche of a society. You take that away, and the society crumbles. And that's kind of what we see here in this particular land. And all of this is happening. Natural catastrophe, uh, a drought, a river drying up. The flood doesn't come like it usually does, bringing in that irrigation and that sediment. But who's causing all of this? Who's, who's using all of this? Jehovah is. Keep that in mind. Verse 11, he gets to another section about how God is judging these people in Egypt. And that is, as we noticed in verse um, 1, or rather in verse 3, I will destroy their counsel. He kind of elaborates on that. In verse 11, he says, Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. Pharaoh's wise counselors give foolish counsel. How do you say to Pharaoh, I'm the son of the wise, the son of the ancient kings. And so you've got all these wise men. Zoan is a um, capital of the pharaohs. And uh, you've got all these people who are wise and people look up to. And things are falling apart. What are we going to do? You remember when Joseph rose to power, um, what was his big thing that he contributed to God using him? Yeah, there were seven years of plenty. And he stored that according to God's instruction as he saw and interpreted that vision. And then you've got seven years of famine. And because of his wisdom and following God's instruction in that seven years of plenty, he was able to sustain the land of Egypt. So naturally, things are going berserk. Leaders, what are you going to do for us? That's why you're in power. That's, that's why you're here and why you exist in your position. And God isn't going to allow any of that to come to any uh, fruitful fru fruition. So verse 12, this might ring a bell thinking of New Testament <coughs> scripture. It's not necessarily a quotation, but he says, where are they? Where are your wise men? Let them tell you now and let them know what the Lord of hosts has purposed against Egypt. Remember in 1 Corinthians 1, when he's speaking about the gospel, it's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's foolishness to the Greek. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And it's similar because he's saying, let them tell you what God has purposed against Egypt. Do you know what the Lord's purpose is? Do you, do you know what he's trying to do, what he's trying to bring about? No, you don't. You, you don't know God's mind. You're, you're not going to be able to figure this out. You're not going to be able to, to escape this. And it's similar because in I, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he's saying, you want to be saved? Well, Jews, you rejected the Christ. That was God's wisdom to save you. The Greeks, you reject a God that's being crucified. Well, that was God's wisdom to save you. So we've got to just kind of trash all of our preconceived notions and rely heavily and totally on Scripture. Um, when it comes down to it, we're not wise, God is. And when disaster strikes a nation like Egypt, when they're renowned for their wisdom and they fail to find a way out of it, then certainly God is glorified in that capacity. Um, he, he continues with that. But notice in verse 13, um, the princes of Noph are deceived. They have deluded Egypt. Um, those who are the mainstay of its tribes. Notice the Lord mingled or has mingled a perverse spirit in their midst. And they have caused Egypt to err in all their work as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. The Lord is doing this, but how's he doing this? Is, is he... Uh, working in some miraculous way, taking away their free will, causing them to be confused and incapacitated mentally. I don't think he's doing anything different than what he did with Pharaoh. Uh, I don't think he's doing anything different than 
what we read of in 2 Thessalonians 2.11 where he stends them strong delusion that they may believe the lie. If we want to be deceived, if we want to be deluded, God will let us be deluded. We see in Romans 1 with the Gentiles. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. What's God going to do for a people like that? He's going to let them go their own way. These wise men, what are they actually looking to for guidance? Remember verse 1. They're... The idols will totter at his presence. It's, it's idolatry. Everyone's looking to a God, whether it's themselves or some idol. And as long as you're not looking to the one and only true God, that's going to fail miserably. God will allow you to, to, to lead yourself in that direction as well. And so all of this God is doing, but he's not necessarily um, using them as puppets where they have no free will. Uh, verse 15, you might remember from chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, that same kind of language of the uh, head and tail and palm branch and bulrush from top to bottom uh, there are problems there in um, chapter 9 it was the head being the elder and the counselor and the tail being the, uh, the prophet so in verses 16 and 17 he says in that day Egypt will be like women and will be afraid and fear because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts which we, he waves over it the, Land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Everyone who makes mention of it will be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he has determined against it. And so perhaps it was that this prophecy had reached by word of mouth um, to Egypt and they're afraid of it. It's, it's not suggesting what this is kind of doing. I, I think verse 18 is the ultimate transition verse. But this is setting up for us some messianic thoughts where Egypt and even Assyria are going to turn to um, Jehovah. They're going to turn to him as they cry out from oppression, and he's going to send a savior. And what it's doing is it's showing the fear of the Lord being struck in the hearts of these people. Obviously, through this judgment and knowing who the God of the Israelites are, they, they cultivated a kind of fear because of him, <laughs> um, because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he had determined against it. And so you've got judgment really doing its job when god judges a people he's trying to get them to turn their attention to him and so in verse 18 you kind of have that transition and you have a, a turning of egypt to jehovah and this is never fulfilled in history you can't find anything that looks like these verses which leads us to believe it's not talking about anything literal but it's speaking messianically uh, in reg especially you think of uh, highway being from Egypt to Assyria in verse um, 23. They were afraid of Assyria. They were afraid. Everyone was afraid of Assyria. There's no getting along with Assyria at this point. Um, but this is speaking to, to a greater time. He says, in that days, five cities in the land of Egypt, verse 18, will speak the language of Canaan and swear by the Lord of hosts. One will be called the city of destruction. Um, reading commentaries, especially in a, uh, a book like Isaiah, you're going to realize that there are some very confusing verses, and scholars uh, far and wide disagree as to what exactly it means. And so I'm not going to be able to tell you with any kind of certainty exactly nailed down, this is it, um, no matter what, it's absolutely the case, uh, but just kind of humor me in this attempt. Um, it's not speaking of literally five cities, it's just a small number. That's all he's speaking about. But then it says they will speak the language of Canaan. In Zephaniah 3 in verse 8, the, the prophecy reads, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, till the day I rise up from plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. <clears throat> Some suggest that this language of the Canaan uh, is that pure language. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It seems that this um, judgment of Zephaniah 3 and verse 8 that precedes that pure language by which men will call on the Lord out of a pure heart matches. Some contend that it doesn't make sense to say the language of the Canaan is the language that is the pure language. Uh, here's what kind of made sense to me is you've got from this judgment, Egypt inclined to turn to Jehovah, but they haven't fully left idolatry yet. And so you, you've got them speaking the land of Canaan, which would seem to me to be idolatry. They're not pure in their religion yet, but
but they're also starting to turn to Jehovah. And this city of destruction is likely a description of the destruction of idolatry um, and, and for, for Egypt and those turning to him. Um, it's the Hebrew word heres. Um, and by a very slight change of one consonant, the word could be translated city of the sun, which is the center of idol worship uh, for Egypt. And so it's perhaps a, a play on words. The city of the sun, the city of idolatry, the city of destruction. Um, and so you've got Egypt idol worship being completely destroyed as they turn from uh, idols to the living God. So hope you're thoroughly confused. <laughs> All right, verse 19, and that day, and so kind of, again, segueing into a different period, he's, he's kind of um, looking at what, what is going to happen in time with the physical nation to this time period of the Messiah. There will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. Never happened physically in history, which is why we can understand this is messianic. Um, there will also be a pillar to the Lord at its at its border, so signifying the pure worship of Jehovah and this uh, memorial of a pillar at the border, and it, the pillar, will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a mighty one, and he will deliver them. So you've got pure worship with an altar, and then this pillar as a memorial, and it's going to be a sign that the Lord will send them a savior. It reminded me, and, and maybe this is way far out there, maybe... Anyone who knows their Bible a little better wouldn't remind them of this. But remember what uh, the, I believe it was an angel said to Cornelius about his prayers and his alms. What did they come up to the Lord as? Uh, a what? Sweet savor. Sweet savor. Okay. A remembrance, right? Uh, there was prophecy in the Old Testament as we've seen already in Isaiah. But also you had Peter speak about it and he didn't even know it. That all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Um, so th there would be a gospel going to the Gentiles as well. Cornelius is a devout man, but he's lost. He's, he's living in a, a, a dead age, patriarchal dispensation. He's not a Jew. Um, he's certainly not a Christian yet. And, but he's wanting to serve God. He's, he's looking, seeking, and he will find. And his alms and, and prayers come up to <coughs> Jehovah to remind him of that. And he sent Peter. So you got here Egypt. They're crying out because of oppression. Mainly of sin, but of all that they've gone through, all this judgment up to this point, and the Lord sends them a savior. The Lord will be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord, spiritually speaking. And how do we know the Lord? How would the Egyptians know the Lord? They will come to Mount Zion to hear the word of the Lord, Isaiah chapter 2. And so this is spiritually speaking. Verse 22, the striking of Egypt is to heal it. So remember, divine discipline is always to build us up, to save us. When times get rough... Think of a passage like Romans 8 or 2 Corinthians 12 or a passage like Hebrews 12 where bad things are happening to the faithful, but it can mold them into a more righteous person, more patient person if we let the Lord do that. When the Lord disciplines, it's ultimately for our salvation. And there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Remember that language in chapter 11. And so you've got friendliness between Egypt and Assyria um, and a going in and out among each other where that would have never been the case. Um, and then in verse 24 and 25, it speaks of unity uh, in the Messianic kingdom. Um, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. All right, chapter 20. It's still talking about Egypt, but also Ethiopia. Um, in 715 B.C., Egypt was overcome. Uh, by the ruler of Ethiopia, he united the two under an Ethiopian um, uh, suzerainty that prevailed until 664 B.C. And so they, they're, they're considered together in this context. Um, and what you have is in the year that Tartan, that is the uh, commander-in-chief of the Assyrians, came to Ashdod when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him. He fought against Ashdod and took it. Um, You've got the Assyrians planning an attack on Egypt in Ethiopia, but they'd have to pass by Philistia in order to get there, so they had to handle Philistia first before they could take Egypt and um, Ethiopia. This, that's the context. In that year, um, God told Isaiah 
to take out off his uh, sackcloth, his, his outer garments, likely that he wasn't totally naked. Um, Delich says that what Isaiah was directed to do, therefore, was simply opposed to custom, common custom and not to moral decency. But he was supposed to walk around as a sign, um, walking naked and barefoot. And then it says in verse 3, this is what he was doing. It was a sign and a wonder against Egypt and in, uh, Ethiopia. The king of Assyria will lead away the Egyptians and Ethiopians in, in shame, just like he was walking around in shame. And so he goes on to apply it. So um, they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation in Egypt, their glory. Speaking to Judah there, don't put your trust in them. And here is a reason you shouldn't. Here's a sign that shows Egypt and Ethiopia, they're going to fall to Assyria. Why would you put your trust in them? So this is a sign against them, but for Judah to understand, don't put my trust in them, put my trust in Jehovah. Here's something practical I want us to get from this, though. Notice in verse 2, he told Isaiah, go and remove the sackcloth from your body, and he did so. Then in verse 3, the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah walked for three years, he, he says that he walked naked and barefoot for a sign and wonder against uh, Egypt and Ethiopia. When God told Isaiah to do this, did he know what it was for? No. Because it says, just as he has done this, here's what it meant. And here's what it's going to come to. Isaiah did something crazy, unheard of, uncommon, because the Lord said to do it. He had no idea what this was for, but he did it anyway. That's what obedience to the Lord is all about. We don't have to understand it completely. We just have to know that God said it, and we don't question it. We just do it. I've been impressed by this section of the nations. You know, it can be a pretty dry study, but when you really get into it, you start thinking about it, and those thoughts start coming from the text. It is a rich and rewarding study because God cares about everyone. He's the God of everyone, not just in judgment, but in salvation. And uh, we should be willing to obey like Isaiah just yes, said. about is you may not understand it at the time but it there's sense to it god doesn't just make us run around doing crazy things because he can there's always a greater plan uh, to this babylon remember we talked about them before earlier in isaiah uh, they're mentioned again in in judgment uh they're going to be judged verse two by media or, or by jehovah media is um the uh tool of, of jehovah's judgment verses three through five You've got something similar to what we studied with uh, the prophecy against Moab, where um, the, the prophet himself laments and is anguished by the prophecy that Jehovah is speaking through him. It, it doesn't bring God or Isaiah joy that judgment is spoken against these people. He's distressed uh, like a, a woman in labor, verse 3. And so um, you've got that terror as well. In verse 5, he speaks about... The mindset of Babylon um, when judgment is coming. Basically, we've 
we, we're sitting at a table. We, we're, we're relaxing. We've got a watchman in the tower. We're eating and we're drinking. Everything's good. We're watching out. We have nothing to be worried about. And what Isaiah says is, arise, you princes, anoint the shield. You, you think you got it handled. You're watching. You're, you're at ease because you think you're, you're on top of things. You need to get ready for battle. <laughs> Whether this is a, a direct reference to Daniel 5 or not, it kind of fits uh, the build there when you've got Belshazzar desecrating the articles of uh, in vessels of the temple and they're parting it up and the writing comes on the wall and then the Medes and Persians attack that night and they're taken off guard and so they're not taking any of this stuff seriously um, and what you have in verses 6 through 9 is the Lord through Isaiah saying to set a watchman he's going to see say what he sees and he's going to say look I see them coming and the Babylon has fallen and fallen and all his idols are fallen as well and he says in verse 10, O my threshing and the grain of my floor, that which I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have declared to you. Babylon was used against God's people to thresh, uh, you know, thresh them out, to, to judge them, to thin out the herd, if you will, to bring judgment against them. And remember, just like with Assyria, he uses them to judge his people, and then he judges them. That's what he's saying. Babylon is judged. In verses 11 and 12, you have Edom. I know we're going fast here. Um, nothing different than usual. So, In verses 11 and 12, you've got a judgment against Edom. We know that it's a burden against Edom because of Mount Seir that is mentioned there, which is where the Edomites dwell. And here's the basic thing. He asks a question, or someone calls out to him, Watchman, what of the night? What of the night? And the watchman says, The morning comes and also the night. You think of this prophetic imagery of judgment, Night means judgment, doom, calamity. He says, when is this going to end? He says, well, the morning is going to come. Maybe you find a little relief and then judgment right after that. And it was until Edom was completely wiped out. That, that was their history. They continually um, saw some adversity until they were no more. Now you've got the oracle against Arabia. And you've got these different cities of Arabia that are fleeing with the uh, um, invaders coming. They've got to take care of each other. But then, uh, within a year, it will be diminished. Um, and this is because the Lord God of Israel has spoken it. Verse 17. In chapter 22, you have a judgment concerning Jerusalem. We've already looked at judgments concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the very first section, the first 12 chapters. Um, but he's mentioned again in the middle of all of these nations. And what we can take from that, I think, is that if you act like the world, God's going to treat you like the world with punishment. And so don't act like the world. It's not that we're redeemed and we're given this pass to where we can do what the world does and we can escape the judgment to come. If we turn back to the world, if we act like the world, it doesn't matter that we were added to the body of Christ at one point in time. You're an apostate. You just don't know it. God will judge you in the end. It's ironic that... Jerusalem is called the Valley of Vision because it's the seat of prophecy. They should know all of these things. And, and, and it comes well before Isaiah when they were taken into the Canaan land to inhabit it. The promise was if you turn to the idols of these lands, then you'll be taken away uh, and, and you'll be uh, made the servants of these people instead of vice versa. And so you've got a judgment against Jerusalem. And there is a man named Shebna who is an officer in Hezekiah's kingdom, who is seen as an individual, a leader of judgment, kind of stands for the whole, but looking at a leader that has led these people in this way, he's arrogant and prideful. He hewn out a tomb for himself. He, he thinks he's big stuff. And not only is he demoted, but he's thrown into a foreign land and he dies. Eliakim, who is a more humble person, takes his place. And so you have the haughty that are brought down and the humble that are Exalted. Um, chapter 23 is a judgment against Tyre. And what Tyre is, is uh, a place of great commerce. That's, Tyre's a big dog because of it being a port city. I think we're familiar with that. And so its claim to fame is everyone's coming through Tyre. Everyone's trading in Tyre, importing, exporting, all that kind of stuff. And because of that, he's been exalted. But... It's going to be judged, and it's going to have a widespread effect. If you've got a, a hub like Tyre, and everyone is depending on it for travel and import, export, all that kind of stuff, 
tire goes down, a bunch of other people go down with it. But eventually, tire is going to come back to prominence. And it's interesting, he describes it like a harlot who retires and then comes back after everyone's forgotten about her. And she's sounding trumpets in the street. She's trying to get people to remember her so that she can do business again. Now, that's tire, tire's place. What's even more interesting than that, I think, I know that the, the light flashed, but in verse 18, not only has he talked about judgment being the Lord's doing, but in verse 18, I mean, not chapter 18, verse 18 of chapter 23, when Tyre comes back to prominence, not like they were before, but they're back in business, and they're, they're turning back to their wickedness and spiritual fornication, if you will, it says that's the Lord's doing, that they're still in business now. But he says it's being used for the good of other people. Not condoning the sin, but even when a wicked people are in power or prominence and some good is coming from their labor, God can use something good coming from a wicked nation or a wicked person to bless someone else. It doesn't condone their wickedness. That just tells me how powerful God is, that he can certainly use the wickedness of nations to judge the wickedness of his own nation. And he can use the the prosperity of a wicked nation and underhanded dealing and all of this kind of sinfulness, but prosperity coming from it to bless other people who need it as well. He is so powerful and gives us all the more reason to trust in him. Harry can clean up my mess one day. We'll be in chapter 24.